Good morning, everyone. It's so good to be here with you. Missed you guys last week, but I heard Rachel did an amazing job leading you in worship. For those of you who are tuning in at home, uh, we're, we're glad that you are. We are with you in spirit, and we hope that you are with us in spirit as well. Um, for those of us that came this morning, and it's good to be back in the house of the Lord. Even though we're probably a little more masked up than we might be comfortable with, that's okay. We're still here worshiping. Um, I, I want to encourage you and exhort you this morning uh, to adopt an attitude and a posture of expectation and hope this morning. We serve a mighty, powerful, sovereign God. We come to him with expectation that he's going to move. Um, it's not just sort of like a fingers crossed hoping, although we do have hope, but we come with expectation that he's going to meet us in a powerful way this morning. So I'd like to invite you, whether you're at home in your pajamas, I'm jealous, uh, or if you're here in this room, can we stand together and with expectation and hope worship this mighty God? There's nothing that our God cannot do. He may do miracles in this room this morning. I, I don't want to discount anything, um, but I just hope that uh, you come with expectation in your heart that he's going to move in a powerful way. Let's sing together. Oh 
to teach you guys a new song. If you read the Old Testament, it's full of crazy stories of like miracles and just bizarre stuff that happens by the power of God. There's this story in 2 Kings 13 where these guys throw the body of a man into the grave of Elisha and he falls on the bones of Elisha and he raises to life. Like just crazy stuff. That is the God that we serve, this powerful God. He turns graves into gardens, things of death into things of life. Oh, 
Lord, there has never been and there never will be anyone like you. God, you are completely other than. You stand apart in the universe as separate and set apart and unique and holy. And we are so not that. All we have to do is just look around. We can see how broken and sinful and needy and messed up we are, and, and yet you draw near to us. You come close. It is your kindness that leads us home. It's in your presence that we find peace and identity and purpose and unity and love, grace, and the thing we need so much mercy, God. We need your mercy. Would you come here and Make your presence known this morning. And maybe for the very first time, there might be someone in this room who sees you face to face for the first time. They come to know and see your beauty. They might be saved. Their, their heart might be transformed and raised from the dead like we just sang about, that you would turn the grave of their life into a beautiful garden. We leave ourselves in your capable hands, your loving hands this morning. May the rest of this service be a fragrant offering, a pleasing worship to you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Can we give the Lord one more hand this morning as we're grabbing a seat? Good morning, guys. You can take a seat. Boy, I'm so glad you're here. I tell you, of all the things that I missed in our three months without being able to gather, uh, what we just did is what I missed the most. I, I love worshiping with you. Uh, that new song was awesome, and uh, just being able to get lost in his presence. And here, stand up front, to hear you guys singing behind me, it just is a great blessing to me. So thanks for being here today. If you're joining us online and you're still at home, thanks for being with us there as well. Uh, I want to mention just a few things um, that are sort of not announcement related, but sort of are. And one of them is the issue of mask. I don't know how many of you saw my blog post that I put out on Friday. Uh, if you uh, don't uh, follow my blog, you should, just because I write... Uh, mainly for you, uh, other people read it, but kurtbubna.com, and I posted something, three-minute read, literally. If you're a sixth-grade reader, it takes you three minutes to read it, 
and I posted that on Friday. And then yesterday, I meant to do like a five or six minute video. Turned out to be 14, 15 minutes, but um, it's because I have some deep passions about this issue right now, and they're not some of the passions that are common in our culture. Um, and I'll explain that what I mean by that in a moment. You know, it's it's uh, if someone had said to me that in my lifetime, I've been in ministry almost 40 years as a pastor. Yeah, I'm old. And someone had said to me that in your season of ministry, that at the same time you would be dealing with a world pandemic, a global recession where the unemployment rate's equal to the Great Depression right now, and on top of that civil unrest, I would have said, yeah, not all at the same time, I don't think that'll ever happen. And here we are. No, no matter where you're at on the spectrum of beliefs about those issues, you can't deny that this is impacting and changing the world we live in. And here's my greatest concern, and here's my little sermonette, my little, my little message before the message today. My deepest concern is not about all the issues that are out there. I didn't mention politics and everything else. My deepest concern is the division, the dissension, the, the ugliness that I am seeing in our culture. Now, I expect it in the world. I don't mean to be ne negative or pessimistic, but it doesn't surprise me when I see our world get uh, ugly with each other on both sides and people getting mean and, and, and vicious. What surprises me and what breaks my heart is when I see it in the church. And I say capital C, the church around the world. But even at East Point, guys, divisiveness, dissension, ugliness is not of God. It's not Jesus. It's not what he would do. In fact, it's one of the things that the scripture says God hates the most is dissension, division. Jesus in John 17 prayed for what? Unity. So that we, that doesn't mean we're all going to believe the same thing. You can have your opinion. You have strong opinion. How many of you have strong opinions? Let me see your hands. If you, if you need one, come to me. I'll give you mine. We all have opinions. We all have strong opinions. I get that. But wherever you land on those opinions, here's the, the one thing that matters most. Paul says, do everything in love. He didn't say, make sure that you're the smartest, wisest, that you got the best argument. Paul said, do everything. And I looked up the word everything in the original language of the Bible, and it's really amazing. Guess what it means? Oh, Bob, you're a smart guy. It's exactly what it means. It means everything. Another passage, Philippians 2.14, we just looked at it a few weeks ago. Paul, uh, Paul there says, uh, do everything without murmuring and complaining. Again, the word everything there means, yeah, you guys. Yeah, everything without murmuring and complaining. As Christ's followers, we, our lives are to be marked by something different than the, the viciousness, the ugliness, the horrific attitudes that are out in our culture. And uh, what you see, uh, some of you have gotten off of Facebook, and I applaud that because it's probably not feeding something holy in you. My point in this, guys, let's be one. We can disagree. Mask, here's what I'm doing. I'm wearing one. I took it off during worship. We've got, if you're, if you're watching online, you don't know this, we have seven and a half feet from where you sit to the person behind you. We've exceeded the social distancing requirements. So when you're sitting, sit, sitting here and you want to worship without a mask, you are free to do so. That's what I'm going to do. But I, be, I wore a mask. Some of you should have seen a look at some of your faces when you came in this morning. What's he in a mask for? And, or something like, good job, you're in a mask. And listen, guys, here's why I'm doing this. I just want to keep doing this. And I want us to be able to gather. I want us to be able to see businesses stay open. I want us to just do, but more than anything, I just want when people look at me to say, he must love others more than he loves himself. Because you know what? I hate these things. I do. I'm just being honest with you. But I love people more than I love myself. I love others more than I love me. And if that helps someone, and again, there are lots of reasons why people don't wear masks. Some of you have physical health reasons. I get that. And let me say two things, and I'll move on. One is no one will ever be shamed. Come in with a mask, come in without a mask. No one's ever going to be shamed in this place. This is a grace place. It's, you're not going to be shamed. I promise you that. Not going to happen. And if somebody shames you, you come see me, and I'll, I'll get after them. Not going to happen. That's not who we are. The second thing I need you to know, and this is important to me, is that I, it's not my job to police this. I am not a sheriff. I have a hard enough time being a pastor. So, you know, our own sheriff is not going to police this. Uh, the, the, our mayor said they're, they're not going to, nobody's going to throw you in jail. You're not going to get, so I am not going to police this in our building. And if you want a room where everybody's in a mask, we do have one place in our building. It's called the Reduced Risk Room. It's over there. And everybody in that room is required to wear a mask and have their temperature taken before they go in. And the chairs are separated social distancing. And it's a big screen TV, it's a live feed, so you can watch it there. So we're providing a place if that's what you want. If you really don't want to even do that, then some of you are at home, and that's okay too. I'm glad you're with us. But if you come in here, no one's going to shame you, and no one's going to police what you do or don't do in this building. Can, can we just say, okay, is that good enough with you? Can you love me and love one another? Good. 
All right, now to the announcements. Done, end of sermon one. Uh, Epic Kids Ministry, we're going to start in two weeks. And I, 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 the first service, a bunch of parents, a bunch of parents applauded that, on that because uh, I know it's been challenging. And we're only going to provide Epic Kids at the 11 a.m. service, this service, primarily because it's challenging to keep the room clean and to maintain all that we have to do. So uh, what I'm asking you to do is if you have children, sleep in a little bit, come to the 11 o'clock service, and you can check them in. We're going through third grade at this time. Now, we'll expand that as we're able to do so, but only through third grade. And part of the reason why we're only going through third grade at this point is because I need, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to volunteer. I, I want you to see this as a, an opportunity to change the life of a child. We've had some people that have not come back yet for health reasons or can't. Some have moved on. Uh, to one couple, great couple, moved to Seattle. So here's the deal. We're, we're, we're running a little low on our volunteers. And the good part is you can serve in one and attend one. You can come to the 9 o'clock service and then serve at the 11. And if you're a parent, here's my expectation. I'll just be clear. If you're a parent, I expect you back there at least once a month. Yeah, but I'm with my kids all week long. Be otherly, be kind, bless, and your kids will love you back there. They will. So I'm asking you to do is, is step up. If you want to uh, email rachel at eastpointchurch.org or just call the office or, or uh, let us know. We would be glad to get you uh, involved helping in that 11 o'clock service. All right. Temporary suspending our morning devotions. I love doing them. Lots of you love them. Uh, we're revamping that and going to release that in the near future. So that's uh, on temporary suspension of, and while we're doing some things to move forward with that. Peace Pantry, uh, I think most of you know that we've been running, we serve lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people. I, I don't know how many hundreds of people um, that have been served at our Peace Pantry. And it was open on Monday and Thursday. It's open now on Thursday only from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So one day, and they were slammed this last Thursday. It was like really busy. And if you walk over there and take a peek, you'll see that our supplies are getting low. When we first started this thing up, you guys stepped up. You were bringing bags of food and helping us out. Thank you. And you really made what we did possible. But we need you to continue to do so. Because guess what? The people still have need. I just mentioned that we're, we, the, the, the unemployment right now is, is equal to the Great Depression. And in my humble opinion, the ripple of what we are seeing is, is not, we're not felt the full impact of this yet. And so we need to continue. So if you bring a little, and everybody combines a little, it gives us a lot to share. You can bring it Sunday morning. You can set it out on the coffee bar, which has no coffee on it. Sorry about that. But you can bring it on Sunday morning to, to, to just set it out there. We'll get it to the pantry or bring it by uh, on Thursdays between 11 and 5 or anytime during the week, 9 to 4, Monday through Thursday. Um, help us help others. That's a cool thing. All right. Um, one thing I just want to mention, one more thing, is we uh, are not passing passing. I had a hard time saying that first service. Passing. We're not passing. We're not passing the baskets for obvious reasons for offering. There are black boxes on the wall. Uh, you can drop your offering in on there. I encourage you to go online. You can text. There's lots of ways to give. But I'm going to tell you why. Why would you bother? Well, it's not just so that we could do an hour on Sunday, in case you're wondering. Uh, you have no idea. Probably most of you know that we've been to Africa, have ministered in Africa, done a lot there. Um, but I want to show you a picture. And this is a shot of a village uh, where that, that pastor is a part of the ministry that we support. And he, in that village, 62 people over the last few weeks have given their hearts to the Lord. Yeah, that's, that deserves a hand yeah. clap for Jesus. 62 people. Now, and that's their church, guys. <laughs> that's dirt floor, sitting around. That's what they do. But one of our core values the, on the wall, purposes is go. And we talk about going here, near, and far. Here, we serve one another near, we serve our city and our and the surrounding area. That's what we do with the pantry and far. And your gifts make that possible. What you do here makes all that we do possible. Not just an hour on Sunday, but everything that we do to bless. And one, I, one of the things I, I want to share the picture of Africa is because let's just be honest. We, there's so much going on about us in America. We get tunnel vision. We get focused on our needs. And what about me and all this? And that's not the heart of Christ either. Jesus was, God so loved the what? the world, everybody. And that needs to continue to be our focus and our heart. All right, I'm gonna invite Jesse to come up. I got to hear the message of the first service. Open up uh, your version Bible app, if you've got that, or Philippians chapter three. And let's give it up for this guy and as he brings the word today. Thanks, Pastor Kurt. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Good. That was enthusiastic. Uh, <laughs> glad you guys are with us this morning. As always, I'm excited to teach, uh, but I'm particularly excited this morning because I think this scripture text and uh, what I have to say this morning is, is really relevant in this cultural moment. 
And what I mean when I say that is our context at this time in America today, everything that's going on. So I really want to just jump right in uh, to the text here. So if you have your Bible or if you have the YouVersion app, you can open it up to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. And I am using the new revised standard version this morning, in case you were wondering. Everybody there? All right. (laughs) Okay, Philippians 3, 1 through 11. Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, and it is for your safeguard. Beware of the dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. All right, so it's a pretty, pretty lengthy scripture text, but uh, a, a powerful one. So the situation here that, that Paul is describing is, is something similar that was happening in Galatia. I don't know if you've read the book of Galatians or are familiar enough with it to know that context. But basically what was happening, the, the Jews who believed in Jesus were strong-arming the Gentiles into adopting their set of cultural norms or practices, particularly circumcision. And we wouldn't know what that's like in the 21st century because we never try and strong-arm anyone into believing what we believe. Cough, cough. That was sarcasm. Okay, you got it. But it wasn't just the cultural practices and and norms and and political opinions or thoughts uh, that they had in the day. These practices and norms had deep roots, really, really deep roots, 2,000 years deep. The Jewish people could trace their roots back to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're talking about physical descent here, lineage. This was the pride of the Jewish people. They were the people chosen by God, the covenant people. Their ethnic lineage, therefore, was their greatest attribute. This was really important because it meant that you were in. You were part of the club, automatically. You were one of God's chosen people because you had the correct record of descent. Think of any group that you've been affiliated with. Maybe you're part of a motorcycle club, academic affiliation, a professional association, Maybe it's just a group of friends. Or think about when you became a follower of Jesus. But think of the moment when you really realized that you were in. You were in that group. You were part of that group. It's powerful, right? It can be a really powerful and and fulfilling feeling to know that you are part of a group. Paul could trace his ancestry back 2,000 years, noting even which son of Israel that he had descended from. Paul's dignity and belonging were wrapped up in his affiliation with the people group Israel, his people. But here's the thing. His pride had become his concern. He was worried that his Jewish pedigree had become an impediment because those descended from the patriarchs assumed they were superior automatically and forever to anyone who didn't share that ancestry. They were superior by default. I'm sure we've never felt like that. We've never felt superior by default just because we who we we are, our education, whatever status we may have. But as was the case with, uh, or as is the case with most groups, uh, the Israelites had group norms, cultural norms, right? And in their case, these practices set them apart 
as the people of God, God's covenant people with whom he had shown favor. And some of these practices uh, kind of, they came to be known as, as covenant markers, these things that really stood out and, and separated the Israelites from the people around them. These covenant markers that were really prominent in the first century were circumcision. We won't go into detail about that. Dietary laws. They couldn't eat certain things like pigs, uh, shellfish, and then Sabbath keeping. They took the day off every Saturday, which was probably pretty nice. I, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want to take Saturday off. But these covenant markers, they defined the Israelites. They were incredibly important. These practices clarified and set apart these people as God's chosen few. Think of group norms that maybe you've experienced. You know, that motorcycle club had like a, a logo or something that you took pride in. Maybe your professional affiliation required uh, some stringent licensing that it was really hard to get. You passed the bar exam. Whatever it is, you're proud of it. Uh, I remember when my, my girls went to Awana and they, they got the vest and they, they started to get little badges and little jewels and things. And they were so proud of their accomplishment learning the scripture passages, but it also indicated that they were in, they were part of this group. That was one of the badges, literally and figuratively, of being part of that group. Think of our Christian faith, our norms, baptism, communion. We come together and worship every Sunday. For a first century Jew, works of the law, these things, these covenant markers, were a badge of covenant membership. When you were circumcised, when you kept food laws, when you kept the Sabbath and did a number of other things, that was a badge of honor. You were part of God's covenant people. Okay, I wanna pause right here. I wanna take a minute and talk about first century Palestinian Judaism. And nothing excites me more than first century Palestinian Judaism. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. But specifically, I want to ask one question this morning. How was it that first century Jews accounted themselves as righteous before God? You don't have to answer. Most of you are probably thinking something along the lines of, of, of works, works of the law, the things that they did, which is true to a limited extent. You know, we think of the, the Pharisees in the New Testament uh, being zealous to complete works of the law. And, uh, but here's the thing. A first century Jew would not have sought after works of the law in order to earn God's favor. Get this, because they already had God's favor. They were the covenant people. God's chosen and favored few. They were already in the club. They were zealous to perform works of the law to remain in covenant relationship with God. Think of their storied past, how many times they had messed up and failed to keep the requirements of the law and stay in good standing with God. So in the first century, looking on their past, they were zealous to remain in good standing with God. So you can see how, all, see how important all of this was to a first century Jew. They received God's favor because of their pedigree, their physical descent, which was marked particularly by those practices, circumcision, dietary restrictions, and, and Sabbath keeping. And here comes Paul out of nowhere, and he says, nope, that's not how it works. He said, your religion is a ritual of externals that foster pride. That's about it. You've missed the point entirely. Paul said, no, we're the circumcision. That's us. We Christians from all ethnic backgrounds, we are the ones who really have claim to the title of God's covenant people. Jews and Gentiles alike who worship God in spirit, as opposed to emphasizing the flesh, who take pride in King Jesus, as opposed to taking pride in physical descent. We refuse to trust in the flesh at all, is what Paul is saying. But apparently there were, there were Jewish converts who didn't like this idea. They didn't entirely agree with Paul, and they were insisting that physical circumcision was a necessary covenant badge of honor uh, in order to be part of God's people. But for Paul, this ritual was done away with. The covenant relationship, once symbolized by circumcision, was now perfectly realized in Christ, his death and his resurrection. And this is exactly his point with this whole spiel, which brings me to my main point this morning. Our record of accomplishment is meaningless, and only Jesus matters. 
Yeah, our record of accomplishment is meaningless and only Jesus matters. And I will unpack this a bit because that's a big, bold statement. But it's kind of what Paul's saying here. So in order to reach this conclusion, Paul was required to jettison his superiority as an ethnic Jew. Not only that, but he was also required to give up his pedigree as an educated Pharisee, which was one of the highest accomplishments um, a Jewish man could achieve in that day. Remember, he was circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was blameless under the law. He's the thing, Paul had checked all the right boxes and he was by all means in the club. Paul was already in the club until he realized he was in the wrong club. Get this, Paul realized that all of the things he cherished were actually destroying him because they made him self-reliant, self-satisfied, content to offer God his own goodness. They acted as an opiate, delaying his awareness of his need for the real righteousness that God requires and only God can supply. What Paul says about this is powerful, and I want to read it to you again, verses 7 through 9. He said, whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and regard them as rubbish, a.k.a. garbage, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. What Paul's doing here is using the language of, of accounting or budget reconciliation, which was never my favorite thing to do at work, but I think I understand what Paul is saying. He said on, on this side of the balance sheet over here, he had all of these gains, the right lineage, the right language, the right education. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He did all the right things. He was blameless under the law. By all measures, Paul was in the, in the black from an accounting perspective. He had more credits than debits. In terms of his status as a Jew, one of God's covenant people, he has nothing on the debit side at all. We see this in verses five and six. Any way you look at it, Paul was in the clear. He was part of the club. He had done all the right things. He was from the right family. Paul was in. But paradoxically, he doesn't count any of it to his credit. He strikes the line through all of the items that appeared to be a credit and instead places them over here in the debit column. Now, I'm not an accountant, but by any means, that's destructive accounting. But here's the thing. Paul had discovered something to put on the credit side in comparison with which everything else could only be considered a debit. That something was, of course, someone, Jesus, the Messiah, our King the same Jesus that emptied himself of his own divine privilege, declining to utilize the wealth and power at his disposal, instead subjecting himself to death on a cross for us, for others. Jesus didn't regard the huge advantage that he had, equality with God, as something to exploit. Remember Philippians chapter two that T taught on? Such a great passage. Rather, Jesus interpreted this as his vocation to die on a cross uh, for the benefit of others, and because of that, God exalted him. So here, Paul is following Jesus' example, and he's saying, the huge privileges that I have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna count those as loss. Remember those privileges he listed in, in verses four and five? He said, these aren't something that I'm going to take advantage of. Rather, he had discovered that Jesus uh, was the true meaning and, and entry requirement into God's covenant, his new covenant. Jesus and the hope of resurrection. Jesus in himself, not pedigree or covenant law, are the means of salvation, the doorway to the age to come. Meanwhile, Israel had been struggling to be God's people according to the law, according to the Torah. The main result had been that they set up a dividing wall between themselves and the Gentiles, a far cry from what God has pro had promised Abraham to bless the nations through his descendants and his lineage. That's why Paul realized and now saw that he wanted none of those privileges. He just wanted Jesus. 
This text is absolutely 100% Jesus-centered and Messiah-focused. But it also serves as a great equalizer, which is desperately needed right now in this cultural moment, like I mentioned. Paul is saying that Christians of, of whatever ethnic background are the proper inheritors of the title, the circumcision, meant in a spiritual way. To celebrate and rejoice because Jesus is Lord and because we are his people. This is the sure antidote to, to get rid of all false beliefs and pride. The qualification to be a follower of Jesus, get this, it transcends and eludes barriers, racism, lineage, education, socioeconomic status, whatever you want to throw out there. Be found in him, not having righteousness of our own that comes from the law or from our accomplishments, but that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. The way we share in the Messiah's faithfulness is by our faith. Our belief that the crucified and risen Jesus is the Messiah, the Lord of the world, and our loyalty to him, that's the sign, that's the badge of our covenant membership. That's the sign of our entrance into this group that we call Christianity. It consists, it consists simply of him, of Jesus, over and against everything else. This is Paul's famous doctrine of justification by faith. It's about the status that we possess and continue to possess as full members of God's people. No matter who our parents were, no matter what our past looks like, no matter what culture we came from, what color our skin is, our socioeconomic status, it's better to have Jesus, even to follow him to death and to the cross, than to have anything and everything else in the world. That's how Jesus can say in the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor. He's not saying that they were blessed because they were hungry and poor. He was saying they were blessed because they have me. Here's the thing, reliance on pedigree, on works or achievements is ultimately self-reliance and it tends to obscure the need for God. God alone is our source of life. Why do you think the church in the West is struggling? It's because we've forgotten the value of Jesus in comparison to anything and everything else. Our balance sheets can get awfully funky, awfully quick. Here's what I mean. The Jews of, of Paul's day were insisting on physical signs of initiation and priding themselves on their own privilege as ethnic Jews. Uh, they were superior as, as God's people. And I think most of us in the room, quick, you, know, you know, that's not us, that's not us. But the truth is, I, I think it often is, myself included. We can potentially fall into the prideful assertion, we are Christians, just as the Jews rested on the prideful assertion that they were descendants of the patriarchs, God's chosen covenant people. Which brings me to point number one. If we aren't careful, our religion can quickly become empty ritual. Nothing more than a boast. Our religion itself can supersede the devotion and dedication to God that must co-occur with our religious practices. The two are not mutually exclusive. They have to happen together. On another note, how often do we take pride in, in our career, our achievements, our socioeconomic status, our physical fitness, our ethnicity, or a million other things? How often do we embrace power systems that boast in the flesh and oppress and disenfranchise others? Oh, you better believe we boast in the flesh. Don't pretend like we don't, because we do. We come up with a bunch of excuses as to why it's okay. I'm in the same boat. I'm not pointing a finger at you this morning. Paul is calling us to give up all forms of gain so that we might experience true gain, which is Christ. Christ himself, not merely the idea of his favor. This is what it means to rejoice in the Lord. This is the joy we find in Jesus alone, true gain. It's Jesus who tips the scales and renders everything else as trash, as garbage, as rubbish. Do you guys 
remember the, the Jonah narrative, God got swallowed by a fish. Anybody, nobody remembers that? Okay, there's at least a few. When Jonah ran from God and, and boarded a ship, God summoned a great tempest to prevent him from leaving. During the storm, it said that the mariners were afraid they were going to sink in the cold, uh, murky waters and die. So they called on their gods, and they also jettisoned their, their cargo in order to lighten the ship. And you think about what this meant for a sailor of the time. It meant that they, they got rid of their cargo and they weren't going to make any money, and potentially they would owe for the cargo that they they lost, I assume. This is how they earned money. So this was a, a big decision, but they, they weighed and measured the outcome. Do I wanna die in the cold, murky waters or do I wanna jettison the cargo and lighten the ship and have a better chance of surviving? Easy choice when it comes down to it, right? I can't enjoy money when I'm dead. <laughs> so here's the thing, Paul, Paul had to abandon his past privileges precisely because they were the very things that were weighing him down, just like the cargo of the ship. They kept him from surrendering to Christ, who is the only access to God. He had to jettison what seemed like valuable cargo in order to save the ship, so to speak. Here's the thing, sometimes we have to do the same thing, as difficult as that is. We have to jettison the cargo that's bringing down the ship in order to save our lives and realize the surpassing value of knowing Christ not just depending on him for salvation, not just looking to him as something that brings us closer to God, although he does those things, but really depending and knowing the value and gain of Jesus. We have to give up all forms of gain in order to get the true gain, which is Jesus. This brings me to, to point number two this morning. If we were to place the whole world with its wealth, power, prestige, accolades, and rewards on one side of the scale and Jesus on the other. Christ alone would overwhelmingly outweigh anything else in terms of real wealth. And you think to yourself, yeah, that's a good idea. I like that conceptually. But then when it comes to real life, that can be, that can be tough, right? It can be tough to actualize that. When I tell people I'm a, I'm a pastor in conversation, one of, of several things happens. Uh, one, they immediately resonate with it because they're a follower of Jesus. And we, you know, oh, I got a church here and like, let's talk about Jesus, that's great. Two, they, they look really guilty because they haven't been to church since Christmas or maybe in years and they don't wanna talk about it. Three, their demeanor changes. They go from smiles and emotion to, to not so much because they do not approve of my career pursuits. I tell you, being a pastor in the 21st century doesn't carry a whole lot of prestige. In fact, uh, the opposite is true. People often look on uh, pastoral with contempt and, and disapproval in a post-Christian society. Here's the thing, though. I am absolutely convinced to my core of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, an advantage that far outweighs anything else, including the approval of the world which I do think about because I'm an Enneagram 2. Come on, Enneagram 2s. Here's the thing. When we dump everything else in the trash in favor of Jesus, when we really do this, it allows several things to happen. First of all, it allows us to sincerely and genuinely rejoice in the Lord. It allows us to rejoice in the fact that he alone is our gain, that even if we're poor, even if we're impoverished, whatever happens in our lives, we have King Jesus to cling to, to bring us through. The only thing that we need. Remember, this is how Jesus can say, blessed are the poor. It's not because they're hungry, it's because they have him. This is the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus and no one can take that from you. Second, and this is the third point this morning and this is important, we're gonna land here for a sec. When we set aside our empty ritual, our pride and our accomplishments, it serves as this kind of great equalizer. Remember how I said this passage was really relevant to this cultural moment in particular. Here it is. Remember how Paul listed all of his accomplishments on this one side of the balance sheet and then drew a line through them, canceling them. That's what we need to do too. <laughs> you have a million dollars in your bank account, an advanced degree in a business. You're a struggling single mother 
living paycheck to paycheck. I'm not pointing at real people. I'm just pointing. <laughs> Strike a line through any, any advantage that you have. What are you left with? Jesus. Okay, you're, you're a teacher and, and you're a mechanic. Strike a line through anything that you would count to your advantage. What are you left with? Yes. Okay, listen carefully, because this is important, and stick with me. I'm white, you're black. Strike a line through anything that you would count to your advantage. What are you left with? Jesus. However, here's, here's the caution. Listen, listen carefully to this, because this is important. While our advantages are rendered as garbage, if we truly approach Jesus with a contrite heart, that doesn't mean that we're all starting on a level playing field, okay? It doesn't mean that we can dismiss one another because, quote, unquote, we're equal in Jesus. Remember in chapter two, Paul said to regard others as better than yourself. Remember when Jesus didn't regard equality with God as something to be exploited. Yes, the scales are reset in Jesus, but that doesn't mean that, that we're in the same starting place as our neighbor. Millionaire, help that single mom with your means. Give her a job, write her a check. Teacher, help disenfranchise students, especially those of color who are at a disadvantage. Mechanic, do some pro bono work for that same single mom. If you have advantage because of your skin color, ethnicity, birth, socioeconomic status, whatever it is, help those who are in need. Try and empathize with those who have experienced injustice, oppression, poverty. Don't cast blame. Paul did. He was the recipient of the promise literally because he was an ethnic Jew. But he set it aside in exchange for the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus. Yes, the scales are reset in Jesus, but that doesn't mean we can ignore injustice. Paul is asking us to, to set aside our privilege, a word that may push some buttons right now, but I didn't say it, Paul did. He's asking us to, to set aside our privilege so that we can have Jesus as our only necessary gain, but also so that we can begin to humbly serve others. How many are willing? You don't, don't raise your hand, but I want you to think about it. How many are willing to actually to set aside your, your gains, your accomplishments, strike a line through them, and look to Jesus only? Are we legitimately willing to set aside the things we count as gain in order to rejoice in Jesus and serve others in humility. And I'm preaching to myself this morning. I hope you know that. I would imagine that you can all probably think of some people in your life who set aside their status and helped you out. I would also imagine that you can probably think of some people who just turned the other way, who could have helped you, but they chose not to. I remember when my department at the nonprofit I was working at was eliminated and I got laid off after nine years. It was pretty devastating. This was like potentially a career-oriented job and uh, I was happy. Besides my severance pay and a few other things, the, the CEO of this organization, it's 700 plus employees, he gave me a call and said, hey, not only can you use me as a reference, but this is what I want you to do. When you're applying, send me an email and tell me where you're applying and I will personally call the CEO of that organization and recommend you. And it wasn't an empty gesture, he actually did it. And uh, I started to receive offers like within a couple weeks and I, I'm firmly convinced that this is because the CEO was calling around recommending me. Like that's a good thing to have on your side. I think of what a humble act that was that the CEO of this 700 plus employee organization would look out for someone like me in, in middle management. To me that seemed like he condescended down to my level, he set his status aside in order to help. He didn't have to do that. He could have looked the other way. When we don't consider our status, our pedigree, our accomplishments, it's from this place that we see the, the value of, of Jesus, but also the, the surpassing value and worth of others because we're on that level playing field. The scales are reset in Jesus. And it's absolutely true that, that some of us have advantages in, in privileges in life, some more than others, but we all have something. And guess what? We have a choice of, of what to do 
with those advantages and privileges. Whatever gains I had, I have come to consider these as loss because of Christ. What I want to do this morning as we wrap up here is, is pray just a little bit because we are in church after all. And I know this is kind of a, a tough topic and I'm asking you to do something that's hard in the midst of an already difficult time. But I tell you what, Christians are sometimes asked to step up. That's always been the mission of the church to do difficult things in difficult times. So I wanna pray a little bit this morning and I wanna invite you to stand with me. Jared's gonna play the keys a little bit. And I wanna, I wanna pray about just a few things. Would you guys stand with me? First of all, I want to invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we humble ourselves before God and before each other. Um, and then I wanna, I wanna say two quick prayers this morning. And while I'm doing this and, and while we're, we're playing our final song, I want you to, to really let the Holy Spirit saturate you and, and bring to your mind um, what he would have you do. The first thing I want to pray about is that the Holy Spirit would reveal areas in our lives where we are boasting in the flesh. We all have them. Whatever those areas of pride that we need to, to strike from the record. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your humility. Thank you for setting aside your privilege and status and humbly dying on a cross for us. It's my hope that you would come in the midst of us this morning, Jesus, and reveal to us those areas of pride in our lives that are prohibiting us from seeing the surpassing value of knowing you. I ask that the Holy Spirit be in this place and that you would begin to reveal to East Point Church this morning those points of pride, myself included, Jesus. I just ask that you would do that right now um, and ask you guys to, to seek out and, and ask that he reveal those things to you. Thank you, Lord. Just take a moment and do that right now. I didn't do this first service, but I feel like I should. How many had something come to mind? I did. Just shoot your hand up in the air as a, just a sign of, of humility. You had something come to mind, an area of pride that you need to strike from the record. Thanks, guys. The second thing I want to pray about is how you can use your advantages, your status, whatever it may be, those things that may have caused us to stumble in the past. How can you flip those on their head? How can you turn, around, turn them around and begin to help others? And this second prayer at its core is an invitation to esteem others as better than themselves, as better than ourselves. The very same thing that, that Jesus did, setting aside his status, his equality with God uh, in order to help others. So I ask that you think about your status, your advantages, your privileges in life. How can you use those to help others? And maybe what I would love is for you to think of a specific instance, a point of, of action a point of contact where you can go out this week and do something for someone else. Let's pray. Jesus, we all have um, something to give, even if it doesn't seem like much. I ask that you would help us use our status, our advantages, whatever they are. Help us to strike a record through them. Lord, seeing the surpassing gain and value of, of knowing you. And second, Lord, that you would Help us to use those advantages to the advantage of others. Help us to esteem others as, as higher than ourselves, Father. Holy Spirit, come and, and show us particular instances in our lives where we can reach out to others, where we can help people. Thank you, Lord. We pray in your name, amen. We're gonna enter into worship together. I wanna invite you guys to keep praying about this through our last um, bit of worship together, and then I'll come up and close us.
Amen. What a beautiful way to end our time together. Again, I know it may seem like I'm asking you to do something that's difficult in the midst of an already difficult time, but that's what we're called to do. That's what being a follower of Christ means. So I wanna continue to invite you to do that. Maybe you didn't know Jesus this morning, but you're thinking, I wanna, I wanna get to know this guy, Jesus, uh, who's full of humility, who's full of, of grace and extends that to us. If you made a decision to follow Jesus this morning, I wanna invite you to pick up one of these packets in the back. It says, so begins this wonderful adventure and has some resources to get you started on your walk with Christ. Also tell somebody, come grab one of the pastoral staff or the person that you came with. Let them know that you made that decision. Also, we have these, these cool COVID communion cups uh, that are pre-sealed on either side of the room. We wanna encourage you to continue taking communion because it's an important aspect of our faith. With that, grace and peace to you this week. So glad you came this morning. Be blessed and we'll see you next Sunday. Amen.